This episode of the Beauté Industry Podcast was brought to you by our Beauté Industry Pro Mentoring Membership. Travel through interactive videos with me as we mentor you through self, business, team, and client development, helping you create a thriving beauty business in 2020. Visit the Beauté website for more information. Hello and welcome to the Beauté Industry Podcast, your online support community for the professional beauty industry. I am your host, founding director of Beauté Industry, Tamara Reed. Here, we are closing the competitive gap and speaking your language. This is a platform created and dedicated to the professional beauty industry, valuing community over competition. We serve to help connect you with inspiration from industry experts, expand your knowledge through educational pieces, and bring you the latest in product and technology innovation. This is Beauté Industry. Hey, hi, hello, happy New Year's. What am I doing in your ears on a Wednesday, you may ask? Well, this is a little sneaky bonus episode, my friends, and guess what? We have a new podcast jingle. How much fun is that? Very 2020, new me, new year, etc., etc. Let's get into today's episode, shall we? My guest today is Rachel Evans of Reconnection Project. Rachel and I connected at a recent photo shoot for a Brisbane women in business magazine where we chatted all things women in business and in particular busy women in busy businesses and I thought what better time to publish this episode than now when you've all had your most busy period and are hopefully spending a little rest and recharge over the summer holidays and are refilling your cup. Rachel is an exercise physiologist, a keynote speaker, and somebody who so beautifully and simply talks about moving your body and mastering your mindset to focus on the calm and clarity which we so need to continue to run our businesses at the capacity which they are required to run. The conversation takes us through looking internally at our bodies, the people who surround us, and also the loneliness that can be associated with business. My cheeky cat, Tiger Lily, felt very passionate about rest and reconnection and chimed in with a few meows here and there, so you can hear her opinion on the piece if you listen carefully. From Reconnection Project, today we welcome Rachel Evans. Oh, I'm so excited to have (laughs) you today. Um, Rachel, we start our podcast with the same question every week, and we start right at the beginning of our person's career. So when and where and why and how all of the things did you enter (laughs) into physiology? So I guess when I was in high school, it was one of those things where I loved health and fitness. I loved feeling healthy. I loved exercise. And I always wanted to kind of go into an industry that allowed me to help people and work kind of in that health science kind of sphere so I was flicking through the university kind of course guide and I saw human movement studies which is what it was called when I was at school I thought oh that looks pretty interesting so four year degree later I kind of emerged as an exercise physiologist and thought I actually really love this I initially thought that I wanted to work with athletes Mm -hmm. and then I kind of got a couple of years into uni and went well, actually that's not my vibe at all I don't want to make elite people better I want to make people who are unwell or aren't at their peak well so I guess that's kind of how I got into that sphere and then since then I've been working as an exercise physiologist kind of for seven plus years um, working in fields such as chronic disease women's health um, musculoskeletal pain and obviously now mental health is where I kind of spend most of my time Amazing. I actually have to admit, I mean, we have a lot of, you know, massage therapists and remedials in our space and you kind of hear of Cairo, but I didn't realize how much I needed physio until (laughs) I just recently started running and my knee hurt. And I was like, who do you go for knees? I was like, that's not really Cairo, but it's not massage. And I was like, it's physio. (laughs) Somewhere in the middle. Yeah. (laughs) Amazing. And so tell me about everything that you're doing at the moment with Reconnection? Yes. So um, my company Reconnection Project kind of emerged a couple of years ago after I suffered some serious burnout. I had 
um, a lot on my plate. I took on a lot of mental strain and then it affected me physically as well. Um, So the work that I do through Reconnection Project is kind of multifaceted. So I'm working one-on-one with clients to help them deal with their own stress and overwhelm and burnout to try and stop them going down the route that I kind of took. Um, And then I'm also doing a lot of speaking events and things like that um, just to kind of get in front of people and let them know what all of this is because I guess before I went through it, I had no idea that this wasn't normal. Um, (laughs) And then also running workshops for people as well. So getting down to kind of the nitty gritty with people and allowing them to I guess, find their own path and their own solutions, making sure that they are looking after their mental and physical health as well. So there's a, there's a few things going on with Reconnection Project at the moment. Yeah, incredible. And I, I like how you say, really, I mean, you hear about words of balance and burnout and movement and da, 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 but until you have almost a problem or something goes oh, wrong 100%. with you, you don't, yeah, you don't really think about kind of going into it any further, right? Yeah. Like I thought it was normal. I was like, oh, everyone feels stressed. Everyone feels really anxious all the time. This is fine. <laughs> when in reality, it's, there's so much that you can do to avoid that kind of stuff and avoid the health implications that come with it as well. Yeah, Mm. and I wanted to speak to you specifically during this time as well, but particularly for the beauty industry because, you know, we are moving and manipulating our Mm. bodies so that we can, as you are, you know, apply pressure and apply movement onto somebody else's body that often, you know, will be hunched over doing a facial Mm. or will be in a really weird position doing a massage. And only when we look in the mirror we go, oh, my goodness, (laughs) look at what my body is doing. And so... I wanted to kind of give this episode almost as a little reset and a gift for our audience. But you talk about movement, you know, in the workplace so passionately. (laughs) And I'm wanting to ask you then, after a big day of treating, it can be exhausting, right, Mm. to, you know, kind of get that energy or motivation and go for a walk or, you know, even perform a workout Mm. because we've been treating all day. But I'm wanting to ask you, why is moving our bodies, especially after a day of treating, so important? And in the workplace, is there, you know, kind of a better or easier way to change our motivation so that we can, you know, (laughs) get up and move after work? Well, I guess at the end of our day, our bodies were made to move. And there's a lot of really positive things that encourage our bodies um, from a very... I guess, primal way to move regularly, um, particularly when it comes to mental health as well. I guess the people that that you work with, like the, the people in the beauty industry, you are doing a lot of physical activity day to day anyway. You're on your feet a lot. You're moving around a lot. There is that slight difference between physical activity and exercise. Physical activity is more incidental exercise is more structured. At the end of the day, it is kind of doing similar things, but that structured exercise definitely does more for our mental health. So as far as motivation is concerned, it is really hard to motivate yourself at the end of the day to exercise, especially when you've been on your feet, especially when you're in an industry where you're talking with people all day, like emotionally, that can be quite, quite exhausting. I guess for me, the advice that I give the people that I work with and the people as an exercise physiologist that I've worked with in the past the best way to motivate yourself to exercise is to do something that you enjoy. So if you are the type of person who loves going for a run, but hates going to the gym, absolutely like put some time in your schedule to go for a run a couple of times a week. And I can guarantee you, you feel so much better at the end of it. If you're relying on motivation to get you from work out the door and into the gym, it's only going to get you so far. Like you've only really got a few weeks of motivation in you before you go, oh, I'm too tired. I've got too much on my plate. So using structure is the best thing you can do. Like book it into your calendar as an appointment and go, okay, this is the time that I'm going to schedule for me as an exercise kind of block and stick to it. And it's just, it's just have it. (laughs) (laughs) And if you're really struggling, like do it with a friend. Like say, okay, we're going to go to the gym together at this time. I'll meet you there. And you're so much more likely to stick to it. And just remember the, how good you feel afterwards, mentally and physically. And that's kind of what gets me through. And it's what gets my clients through as well. I so appreciate you saying there that it's not all motivation because like only just recently I've started running Mm. and 
no one's bloody motivated at 5am no. to go for a run <laughs> in 39 degree Queensland heat. <laughs> no. So I like that because you do see on Facebook and Instagram, oh gosh, everyone's yes. like, get motivated, get up, get hyped. And I'm just like, where do you get that yeah, from? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not real. Like it's all a bit of a facade really on socials because you're not motivated. And sometimes you've just got to trick your brain into doing it anyway because you know that you'll feel better. Yes, Mm. and I I appreciate the structure word there because Mm. for me now, like I know I'm not going to be motivated to get up (laughs) and go for a run, but I know if I get out of bed, and this is too much for a podcast, but I sleep naked, right? (laughs) So if I live in Queensland, (laughs) if I get out of bed and my gym clothes are literally right there on the Mm. floor, it's the first thing I see. I just get up and put them Mm -hmm. on, and then I'm like, oh well, I'm already wearing my clothes. I might as well go for a run. Yeah, exactly. It's already done. I may as well do it. Yeah. Yes. Amazing. And so I want to talk to you as well, keeping in with the kind of workplace theme Mm. about workplace hygiene, because as you said, especially for us, you know, we're treating clients, we are listening to their stories, listening to their emotional baggage all day. Sometimes we take that on for ourselves, and then we go home, we take that into the home place as well. So I've heard a lot about kind of workplace hygiene. Mm. What is it? And (laughs) can you just brief that out for us? Yeah. So for me, the way that I describe workplace hygiene, hygiene, I can't even speak. Workplace hygiene is setting (laughs) those boundaries, I guess, for yourself to keep yourself mentally safe, I guess. So like you said, you're taking on a lot of emotional baggage. You're working face-to-face with people all day. That is quite exhausting. So putting boundaries in place is really important for protecting your own mental health. So when I say boundaries, it's things like having a set time to switch off each day or having a bit of a debrief with your colleagues or with your partner or with your friends around things that may be playing on your mind. Because I guess in the beauty industry, very similar to the industry that I come from, it's, it's intense. Mm. (laughs) It's a lot of talking to people and, if you're naturally an extroverted person, that's great, but there's only so much of other people's stories that you can take on. So it, it's a lot of boundary setting for me. Yeah. And too, you know, we think about now is that kind of Christmas time, New Year's mm. time. It's so easy to work through your break or, mm. you know, to be cleaning up in the back kitchen or setting up for your next treatment. And sometimes, you know, it might even just be as simple as taking your actual lunch, you know, mm-hmm. like leaving your space and going and eating without talking to anybody else. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like that is one of the biggest things that especially when you are trying to do everything and especially this time of year when it is so busy and people do come in with I guess more in their minds than normal you feel obligated to give all of your time plus more to people but like what time is left for you Mm. (laughs) so if you're not it's that that whole you can't pour from an empty cup type thing so if you're not constantly doing the small things that fill up your cup you can't help yourself help others as well as yourself Yeah, I love that. Mm. And I'm wondering then if we are going to implement any three things into Mm. our lives to better the workplace hygiene, what are those three things and where do we even start? Yeah, so you touched on it just then. One of the biggest things is take a lunch break. Like you cannot work through the day without eating or with eating sporadically throughout the day. Like you need that energy. You're on your feet all day. (laughs) You need that mental break as well. So if you can't go outside and take a lunch break like that's the best thing you can do just have some downtime and allocate that 20 30 40 minutes if you can to just enjoying your food enjoying your own mental break time um (laughs) as well as that like I said before taking that time to actually switch off from work so what I like to recommend is setting a time each night so say you get home and Seven o'clock is when you stop doing emails, you stop looking at anything social media related to do with your workplace, like absolutely switching off and engage with your family. So engage with your partner or your kids or your housemates or your friends or whoever is in that bubble and just disengage from work. Because if you are constantly thinking about work and the things that you've got to do and the things that maybe went wrong during the day, that is impeding into your own personal kind of home time, which is 
okay in the short term but in the long term it gets really grating (laughs) Mm. and the last one I think in there is to organize your time and tasks so if you know that you've got a certain amount of things that you have to do in a day and it's way too much try and delegate like if there's someone else that you can get to do some admin task or something small that maybe you don't need to have on your own plate for that day do that but if not try and really schedule out what you need so that you know where your time is blocked because so often we try and multitask and it just doesn't work. <laughs> no, <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't. No. I end up doing everything just half half. Oh, absolutely. Amazingly. Mm-hmm. Or I'll have 50,000 tabs open on my computer screen and uh-huh. I'm jumping back in between, you know, moderating the Facebook group to writing mm. this week's blog piece to then organizing a podcast. Mm. You know, it's, I'm just got so much on my brain and then I end up, <laughs> feeling exhausted and going down and eating chocolate because I'm like, yeah, I need a break. <laughs> absolutely. And when we try and multitask too much, well, when we try and multitask at all, like you said, you <laughs> half ass things. You don't actually ever give anything your full attention. So you're constantly scattered, which is just scattering your energy as well. Yes. And for um, a little tip for the people who may be working in shopping centres, mm. um, it's so hard in a shopping centre to get outside on your lunch <laughs> break. Um, I always just used to make for sure that I had my headphones in. Perfect. You know, so then I'm not listening to all of that kind of background noise pollution. Yes. I'm not hearing the kid cry or the mum The Christmas carols. Off, the Christmas, <laughs> exactly. And I'm just listening to whatever that may be, switching off, eating sushi for two minutes and then going back to work, you know. So even if you can't get outside, there's other ways that you can kind of work around it. Yeah, or take a book or listen to like an audio book or like a a nice upbeat playlist or something like that, something just to get your mind away from work and just enjoy that time. Yes, and I want to talk to you about being around people who we do want to enjoy that time with Mm. because – I'm a massive advocate in just surrounding yourself with, you know, people who are smarter or more accomplished where possible um, that I personally can as well so that I can just soak up everything and advance (laughs) my set of skills. But sometimes there are people who, you know, may be more negative and, and, Mm. you know, they're not our biggest cheerleaders. So Mm. I'm wondering then how much importance should we be placing on the people that surround us? Yeah, the people who surround us are super important. So, like we all know that we're we're a product of our environment. So if we're surrounding ourselves with people who are very negative and toxic and have that mindset that kind of bring you down, you're more likely to feel the same. Whereas if you're surrounding yourself with people who are really positive and motivated and upbeat, that's going to hugely affect your motivation and your mental state as well. So the people around us hugely influence our behavior as well as how we feel and, and our mental state as well. So surrounding ourselves with that positive environment is going to make us feel more positive but it's also going to facilitate a growth mindset so we're not kind of stuck in thinking this is the way that things are always going to be I can't get myself out of this bubble that growth mindset is I can do and be and go and do anything that I want to do in my life because I'm not limited by my surroundings or my setting Mm, yeah I love it and and you know sometimes I think though it's harder to look at your inner circle than it is to look outside. Oh, definitely. (laughs) We're very in our own bubble and we think, especially when people surrounding us are people who we've known since we were kids or people who are there because we've known them for a really long time, it's then hard to change the people that we surround ourselves with as well. Yes, because you don't all of a sudden want to go, okay, well, you're in a fixed mindset, I'm in a growth mindset, Mm. see you later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Even though we've been friends for 15 years. Yeah. (laughs) You're not good for me anymore, we're going to go. Yeah, I think that's the hardest thing. Like there's there's the identifying that, oh, maybe this friendship or this relationship isn't good for me, but then it's the what do I do about this? And that's the hardest thing really. And it's it's a case-by-case basis. (laughs) Yeah, and sometimes as well, I guess, you'll kind of naturally drift away from those people because mm. they'll they'll just feel like you're not on that same wavelength mm. anymore or you kind of lose touch or don't have as much in common with them. Yeah, for sure. And that's, I guess, the nature of relationships as well where like sometimes they are really helpful for us in that time and that place, but as we grow and as we move apart, we just kind of naturally go our own ways and that's that's good as much as it can feel quite painful at the time it is good to surround yourself with different people at different stages of your life 
Yeah, and this too can kind of leak into the workplace as well, you know, talking about you're only as good as the company you Mm. keep. Like, yes, your boss and your manager and, you know, whoever's, you know, kind of in that leadership space are going to be authoritative Mm. and they're going to be leading you or directing you, but there's there's a particular way that you can do that without feeling like you're being bullied or Absolutely, and sometimes it's that really fine line between being motivating and being micromanaging (laughs) (laughs) and sometimes like as an employee sometimes you don't really get a say in the way that people manage people think that they're doing the right thing but actually it's not the right thing for you if you feel like you can't say that this actually is not helping me you need to find strategies that are going to help you through that as well because if you're in that industry You obviously love what you do. You love working with people. That manager is a small part of what you do, but it can feel so all-encompassing when you're in that environment and you're constantly feeling like you're being micromanaged. Yes, especially if it's your first job Mm. out of beauty school or out of uni because you don't know what you don't know and you get into the industry and you go, oh, my goodness, is this this what I've signed (laughs) up for? This is the way it is, yeah. (laughs) Yes, I had that actually in my first job. I got there and... Um, the business owner was swearing every day. Oh she was gosh. hung over every day. Oh she was phoning me at ridiculous o'clock. And I was like, is this what full-time work mm. is really like? Mm. You know, <laughs> I, I was just beside myself. But once I realized, okay, I cannot surround myself with people like this after six months of trying my little heart out, mm. um, move space. And I was like, okay, that is not normal. <laughs> and I think the thing to learn from that as well is like, unless you've gone through that experience, like you said, you don't know what you don't know. So unless you've gone through that experience, you don't know that that's not the way that things are done or you don't know how to handle that situation as well. So like for you to have gone through that and then come out the other side and go, oh, it's so much better out here. You now almost know your worth and what you will take and what you won't take as well. Yes, absolutely. And I guess, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. The me now at 30, I would tell that person right where to go. But the absolutely. me then at 21, I was like, oh, my goodness. Just grateful life. for the job. Yeah, yeah yes, exactly. Um, I want to talk to you about sleep because mm. you are a big advocate at yes. sleep. And I have just fallen back in love with sleep. <laughs> sleep and I did not have a very good relationship while I was starting our beauty industry but I'm back on the sleep train now, which is amazing. Good. <laughs> um, and everybody does know, you know, recommended eight hours of, is sleep, you know, bleh, words, recommended <laughs> <right> hours. <laughs> I know, aren't we? We need a coffee. Um, you know, eight hours per night, yeah. right? So why is the magical eight number? And if we don't get enough sleep, how does that actually kind of impact how we function? Yeah, so... A lot of research has kind of gone into saying like eight hours. So the window is seven to nine hours for adults. Yeah. And then it's a bit like more when you're kind of either side of that adult range. So if you're a little bit older or if you're a a child or a teenager or a baby, (laughs) it's it's a lot more because we need to develop and um, our brains need to have that kind of restorative um, process for a little bit longer when we're a little bit younger or older. So Often in in business in general, really, that being really tired or exhausted is seen as a bit of a status symbol. So I know definitely when I was working in gyms or when I was working as a subcontractor, it was a huge status symbol to be the first one in at the gym at four o'clock in the morning and the last one out at nine o'clock at night. And right. <laughs> yeah, it which is like mentally not great crazy yeah crazy but then also like we need sleep being in sleep debt has a whole heap of of mental and physical implications so research is kind of saying that getting anything less than six hours of sleep if like if you're a parent that's different but getting anything less than six hours of sleep um, increases our cortisol level so cortisol is a stress hormone Um, It increases our blood pressure. It increases our insulin resistance, which is a precursor to developing type 2 diabetes. Um, But it also does things like it decreases our reaction time and it makes our memory really poor and it it reduces our cognitive ability. So if you are in the beauty industry and spending your day um, doing things where you need to be really 
on task and really detail oriented, if your reaction time and your memory and your cognitive de- uh, ability are being reduced because you're getting six hours of sleep per night, that's something that you can change. <laughs> yes. And with that as well, what the research is kind of telling us is that if you're consistently getting six hours of sleep per night, even if it's only like over a couple of days, you're actually not able to reliably gauge how tired you are. But those cognitive declines are still there. So you know how people often say, oh, I can exist off six hours of sleep or I can can perform off four hours of sleep. You think that you can, (laughs) but you actually can't. So even though you're not feeling as tired as you probably should, you're still getting those um, those issues with your cognitive ability. Interesting. <laughs> that was me. That was yeah. me. I was like, I, I don't need sleep. Oh, I can just absolutely. go to bed at three a.m. Yeah, after yeah. writing, you know, a big a big project or a big draft of something, and then yeah. have a coffee and still go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it just compounds as well. So uh, week after week after week, your reaction time and your ability to communicate is just getting worse and worse and worse interesting Mm. and I guess this all adds up then to the overwhelm Mm -hmm. you know we've spoken about sleep and the company and workplace hygiene Mm -hmm. and movement and you know that combined with everything that we're doing you know 99 percent of the beauty industry is women so Mm. then we've got our households and schools mm-hmm. and everything else. Yeah. I mean, I I call this mental load, you mm-hmm. know, which is becoming more of a buzzword now, which is all of the pressure that we put on ourselves. How can we actually reduce that? Is there a way or are we just doomed to forever thinking <laughs> a million thoughts? <laughs> like the brain just keeps going. Yeah. But, yeah, you're absolutely right. So we're not just going to work or running businesses. We've got friends and families and hobbies and other things that require our attention and our time. So for us as women, we need to be able to manage that. Otherwise we're going down the path of burnout. Um, The the concept of overwhelm is something that I work on a lot with my clients. So for each person, I come up with a specific strategy, but at the end of the day, it's all about managing your time. Like we said before, multitasking just isn't efficient. Our brain's can't do it so if we're trying to juggle a million different things at once it's just going to stress us out (laughs) so in order to actually manage that mental load we need to know where our time is going so we've only got a set amount of time in the day if we're trying to squeeze double the amount of stuff as we actually can do in that time we're dooming ourselves to fail so it's that whole delegation thing as well if we've got a partner what can they be doing that we don't actually have to take on? Because so often I think as women, we try and take on everything and stay in control of everything when the reality is we just can't. (laughs) Yes, I love that because even like I am a very, very, very big control freak. Oh, me too. (laughs) And every night I make dinner Mm. and um, last night was Sunday and my husband was like, that's it, Tamara. I just, I want to make dinner for you tonight. You've been working so hard. You've made dinner for me for ages and I want to make it for you. But it was my signature dish that he was cooking. No. I know, I know. <laughs> so I make these meat-free Mexican bowls that oh, are God. divine. Oh, so and <laughs> I'm sitting on the couch trying to relax oh. and I'm seeing him put like a whole capsicum in instead of half and then a whole <laughs> onion in and then like three chilies. And I'm sitting there going, Tamara, just relax. Chill. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, don't tornado on him right now. It's okay. <gasps> And then I was like, do you know what? What's a few extra capsicums or onions going to do? Who cares? It's a Sunday night. It's a Mexican dish. Enough, (laughs) you know? But And and it's just in our nature sometimes to just take over. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're that type of person who, like, if you're A-type and you like (laughs) to have control of everything, it is really hard to relinquish that control sometimes. So, like, if you're going to delegate, delegate. <laughs> don't, yes. don't kind of half ass it, go all the way, but give them a really <laughs> clear plan of what you want. Like if you want something, you, if you want a task done and you don't give them all the information, it's not going to get done the way that you want it. And then you're going to feel like you're going to have to do it all again. So yes. delegate with detail, but then also make sure that you're putting time into your schedule to self-care. So self-care doesn't necessarily mean, like do meditation or 
go to the spa or whatever. It could be as simple as going for a walk with a friend or reading a book or doing some deep breathing. Like it is just something that gets yourself back online. So I often talk with my clients about that fight or flight response that comes when we're just constantly in overwhelm. So our bodies are going, oh my gosh, you're in a scary situation. Like there's something chasing you. (laughs) We need to go now when you get that huge influx of your stress hormones. But that's not how we think rationally. We don't make good decisions when we're in that fight or flight mode. We need to use the front of our brain. That is our, like our cognitive reasoning. That's how we actually do things (laughs) with meaning. So in order to get that part of our brain back on, we need to be really mindful and aware of what we're doing. So there's a couple of different techniques that you can use, but one of the easiest ones that I really like to use with my clients because it's very subtle is looking around you, picking a color and naming how many things you can see around you with that color. So I did this on on the train the other day because I was feeling a little bit on edge and a little bit like, oh, I'm a bit flighty right now. So I was like, okay, color blue, what can I find? So like you're looking at the chairs and the floor and the things like that, but then you really start to focus on, oh, that guy's shirt's blue or that person's shoelaces are blue. And you really start to bring that prefrontal cortex back online and it makes such a difference <laughs> to your oh clarity my God, of thought. I love this. Yeah. This is the best exercise ever. And it's so time efficient and it's so subtle as well. Like you don't have to do a big song and dance about it. It is just 30 seconds out to go, yep, I'm back. <laughs> Oh, I so love that because I'm not a meditation and yeah. sit down because my mind is too busy. It's like hard. I, yeah. I find, yeah, I find it really hard to turn that mind off. And, and especially when we're in business or when we're in the treatment room, we're thinking about so much that's uh-huh. going on. You could just go, okay, what is green? Maybe the towel, maybe the curtain, yeah. maybe the face mask. I really like that. I yeah. It's really practical. Absolutely. Especially in those times in a treatment where you don't have to hold conversation it's if you've got a million things going through your mind, 30 seconds out of that kind of space and you'll feel so much better. Incredible. And all of this conversation really, you know, it's not really bought up because a lot of our industry is either we're in the treatment room by mm-hmm. ourselves or we're business owners, mm. you know, and then we don't want to talk to anyone else because, <laughs> of course, that's competition, you know, yeah. um, which is the exact reason why we exist. But I'd love to open a conversation with you around lonely in business, mm. you mm-hmm. know, because sometimes we're not alone because we're talking to a lot of clients, but we do still feel like we are lonely. Yeah. Um, is it? of importance that we don't feel that way in business or is it okay and we should just kind of stick to our own box and focus on what we're doing? Yeah, no, absolutely not. So disconnection and that feeling of loneliness, we're finding more and more is one of the leading causes of depression. So when we feel disconnected, like you said, like you're spending your whole day talking to staff or talking to clients, but that is quite a super official level of connection the connection that we need to actually thrive is through like deep social connection so beyond that it's our close family and friends and people that we feel like actually know us that is the connection that we need and if you don't have it that's fine we can like there's always ways that, ways that you can form that connection ongoing as well so if you're in that little work bubble And like you said, there's competition with other business owners and other people in the industry. It can feel very isolating and it can feel very hard to be, I guess, mentally positive about the work that you're doing because your brain's telling you you're not connecting with anyone. (laughs) We're we're in danger type thing because that's how we've thrived as humans. We've formed connections with people in social groups. And, yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, like in the past, we have had ways to connect. We've had um, social connections through religion or through community. And we're just so busy now that we don't have that anymore. Yes. It's mm. almost coming back to, you know, that animal kingdom really. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's very primal and you were kind of walking around in packs and in groups mm. and kind of hunting together and now you know, almost thanks to technology, which yeah. was supposed to connect yeah. us more, um, has actually disconnected yeah, us more absolutely. than ever. Yeah, more connected in some ways, but less connected in the ways that count. Interesting. Amazing. Rachel, thank you so much That's for being okay. a guest on the thank podcast you. today. I loved it. 
I absolutely adore conversations like this where we refocus on the things we have intrinsically learnt and get thrown out the window when we're super, super busy. There's no better time like now to start re-implementing them into our lives being the new year. From movement to sleep, our environment, company and connections we keep, every little thing or person we surround ourselves with impacts who we are and the behaviours that we elicit. So it's important to spend time opening our peripheral vision and noticing things within our boundaries. Touching on the part where Rachel mentioned disconnection being one of the leading causes of depression, I urge you to come and connect with myself and the beauty industry community in 2020. For the exact reason that I want every business owner to be able to feel supported, this podcast exists. But for real life connection, experience is why our Beauté Brunch networking events and our Beauté Industry Strategy Summit exists to limit the overwhelm and reduce the mental load. You can find loads more incredible mindful information from Rachel on socials at re.connection underscore project, us of course at Beauté Industry and myself at Tamara Shaw Reed. Hoping you have an incredibly restful and safe new year. Until next time, stay connected.